I want you to think back to the first time you ever remember being truly afraid. What was it? Does it stick with you today? This is the sort of thing that we talk about on the house of Asher. Won't you join us? Hey, welcome back to House of Asher, episode 10. I'm your host, Steve Asher, and with me today is Brittany Lozoya, and we're going to be touching on spooky childhood, kind of like passed on nightmares, really. Um, a lot of people have different things that traumatize them when they're small, different things that they've seen or heard or thought they've seen and heard and whatnot. And, but these are things that were passed down from my mothers, grandmothers, aunts, things like that. Um, the thing that I was going to touch on that really stayed with me from when I was small was Bloody Bones. And uh, Bloody Bones basically was a story that moms would tell their kids and basically to get them to stay in bed. You know, if you're out of you're out of bed, Bloody Bones is going to get you. You know, stay away from the windows or he's going to snatch you up. You know, stay in your bed, go to bed. And uh, being from the South, I always thought that this was something that was passed, that maybe like an African story that was brought over with with the slaves and passed down to the children in this area, you know, because uh, a lot of times those are the people who manage the children, you know, they were like the nannies and whatnot. And um, the gist of it was there's this very big animated, reanimated skeleton. Basically it may have a little bit of musculature on it, but very little. And this thing would come up out of the ground from the local graveyard or from, whatever little cave or den and it crawled up under and would burrow itself into. And, you know, like my mom would be telling me, it's okay. It's, you know, it's coming through the cemetery gates, bloody bones. Okay. Now it's walking down close to, through, through the courthouse and rounding the corner down by whatever, you know, whatever local markets by your house, bloody bones. And every time you say bloody bones, a little scarier to the point where finally it's, you know, it's at the corner of your, your neighborhood is walking past your bike in the yard and all that. I mean, just building the tension to where it's like, hey, it's in the house. It's going through the living room. It's at your door, you know, and then, you know, it's opening your door and it gets you, you know, and you, ah, you scream and all that. And it, it, it was scary, but it was also kind of fun because, you know, you didn't really think there was a whole lot of truth to it. I always thought this was something my mom made up, but the way I understand it was that this was a early, like 15th century English uh, or Welsh creation um, there was a movie by Clive Barker uh, and, called Rawhead Rex, and Rawhead Rex and Bloody Bones back at that time was sort of they were kind of like like a Marvel team up. They were like they were always doing crazy mean crap together, and basically Bloody Bones would drag you back and gobble you up, and so next time you would see the Bloody Bones, it would be covered in the blood of whatever kid that wasn't listening. Rawhead Rex was kind of a little bit different. It was more just eat you up there and bash you to pieces. But that always stayed with me. And I remember my brothers always would scare me. They would put ketchup on their hands and stuff. And I'd be trying to lay in bed. And they'd be sliding their hands, you know, at the foot of the bed. And kind of tap the bed enough that you wake up and you see this bloody hand. And you're like, ah, oh my God. And you're screaming and crap. Um, so that that always stayed with me. And I always thought that was a really interesting thing. And I, I guess it was just a cautionary tale that was indicative of a lot of cultures and Brittany as you know like I said and as you've told me there's things like the Kokoi and other creatures like that that had that same sort of cautionary tale in its makeup can you uh, tell the people a little bit about the Kokoi? Yeah um, actually the Kokoi originally came from Africa and it ended up really it started in Portugal and it was a way for uh, single parents to keep their children from misbehaving. They would tell their children little stories about the Kukoi. Now, with Portuguese, it's called El Coco. And in Mexico's folklore, they went ahead and they changed his name to Kukoi. It made him just a little bit more of a... Um, the modern 
a boogeyman that every little kid is afraid of. They let us know that he's a small, little, hairy creature with glowing red eyes, got big, bat-like ears, and a mouth full of razor sharp teeth that if you don't behave, the koi comes and takes you away and hides you in the bottom of the pit of his mountain lair. Well, let me ask you something, Brittany. Now, this creature sounds kind of similar to like Chupacabra and some other creatures. Now, did they sort of like where Rawhead Rex and Bloody Bones would be seen sort of in the same areas together? Like like modern day things, you know, you hear stuff like Bigfoot. There's a ground where UFOs are at or sightings and things like that. Did this creature, was it kind of a, a loner creature or did it develop from another creature? Or, you know, or, or um. I believe that he actually was originally all by himself because it was something that was started, literally it was started by a mother who had anywhere from like six to nine children and her husband was in the guerrilla warfare in the Portuguese military and he ended up getting, you know, injured in battle and dying in battle. Well, at that point, the father was no longer there to be the one to do the disciplining. Right. And the kids got a little rambunctious. And, you know, it was hard for her to get them all to lay down at night and go to sleep and stay in their bed. So what she started telling them was that what we... Uh, depict as a goblin nowadays in like, you know, from the Lord of the Rings and movies like that that they've come out with. What we depict as a goblin is something that we've always had in our Hispanic heritage that have always been the little creatures that if you're doing wrong, they came to take you away. Well, the mother took it just that much further and told the children that not only was this little goblin going to just come and take them away, he was going to take them away and eat them. That he preyed on children that were disobedient and didn't stay in their beds. So it was a form of the boogeyman in the worst way possible. So it's like Whereas the chupacabra actually came out to being a real live creature that is a mix of more than one animal that is just as scary and you don't want to come up on. Okay, so it's sort of like a Grimm's fairy tale, like amped up to eleven. It's sort of like and, and yeah, yeah. It, we'll see. That's it's a, like how uh, we look at our modern day Little Red Riding Hood. Well, if you go over and, you know, you ask German and Russian children, they they know about Little Red Cap. And the story of Little Red Cap didn't go as nice as our Little Red Riding Hood in the end still living. Little Red Cap didn't make it. Yeah. So, well, that... Yeah, and, and, very much like those. Well, it seems like it shows uh, the... Uh, I guess just the difference in times. I mean, uh, you know, pe children are just it's just as frail now as they were then. But there's a uh, life seemed like it was just really uh, could be over very short and very quickly. Uh, and I think it was one of those things. It's like, look, we're not pulling punches with you if you go out running the trails at night. You know, wolves can get you. Wolves will eviscerate you. That's what wolves do. And um, yep. and you know, that's the thing you're talking about, like multiple children and all that. Because I was the youngest of seven. And, uh, which, you know, I, I wish I had had the insight or the hindsight to ask my mom, look, where did you get these stories? Who, you know, where do they come down from? But, you know, when you're a little kid, you're running around playing with GI Joes and worried about making forts and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And your mind's not kind of necessarily where it's at. I mean, I, I tried to, you know, talk with my grandmother and my great grandmother the short time I had them, uh, about some of the the way that they grew up and, and some of how their childhood was. Um, 
which they never really got into it too much because I think it was just a thing. It was so brutal. They were just like, well, you know, what's the point in telling this kid this, you know, just this kid's not had to deal with that. Just let, let him have whatever life he's got. But, uh, it does seem, uh, which is, at least on my, on my end, you know, we were a poor family and it was one of those things where that was a safeguard and it really was something meant not just to scare the kids, but like you said, to keep them from getting hurt, you know, Stay away from the. We had a thing called the Blue Springs. Blue Springs was where they had had a uh, a mine, and I think they pulled up. I guess it was limestone, and when rainwater would collect in there, it would it, it would guess it would seep uh, seep out uh, nutrients and minerals out of the stone, and it would make the water really blue. And a lot of kids loved going swimming there. Well, we've had a lot of kids that used to would jump in that, and you couldn't gauge because it was so clear how how deep it was and they would break necks and a lot of kids died in it. My brother Robert almost died in it before. And, uh, you know, I remember similar stories to bloody bones and stuff, you know, stay away from the water or, you know, like, the, you know, the woman, in the water gets you and things like that. And the, uh, I'm blanking. What's the story about, about the mother who lost her husband? Uh, la, 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 something. La Lorena? La, la, what? You know what I'm talking about? La Lorena? Where the, I'm sure I'm butchering oh, yeah. it. That's it. Yeah, I'm butchering it. Uh, you know, there's all these crazy cautionary stories, and um, it seems, especially if you're in sort of isolated, folky areas, um, that's what you have. You have a lot of folklore. You have a lot of these oral traditions. And because um, I know you were saying your husband who... We still keep with these traditions, you know, we we keep with the traditions because you have to keep the children's imagination going. Right. If children don't have imagination, then they'll end up not living a, a full life. You have to have imagination to be able to want to be something. You have to imagine that you can be that thing. Well, I mean, in, so well, I know just it. playing with uh playing against people's emotions to signify different things and keep you not necessarily um, timid or skeptical, but to make you know that there are other things out there. Right. They make you wonder. Well, and I mean, whenever my Nana ever told me the story, like, she would go all out and we would have the candles lit in the house, right. you know, she'd make sure it was a real good day to tell us some stories like this. Well, and she'd scare the crap out of us. We wouldn't move from our beds when we, not whatsoever. No, right. no, we weren't even looking underneath that bed because we were told if we even so much as put our heads on the side, he would slowly grab us out from underneath our blanket. That's the worst. And take us underneath the bed. And then once we were underneath the bed, there was no telling where we were going. Right. Well, I mean, there's... We were tortured. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, and there's that element, too, because like you said, it it is an oral tradition, and it is, and it is part of your history um, that a lot of kids that... I mean, I guess maybe in larger towns, but... I know especially people that are in more rural areas, uh, those old folk stories and, and, you know, old wives' tales and all that stuff, that is really a big part of their history. They have come from something, though. Well, sure. Every, yeah, I mean, every, you know, even the urban legends uh, is rooted in some sort of truth, you know. But, but I know you were saying because your husband uh, is Mexican, he said, or I believe you said that he had had, uh, had I guess, slight variations of the stories that you knew? Or what, what did you say? Yes. Okay. Um, well, with me being Puerto Rican and my husband being Mexican, we got told different stories of the Kukui. Um, like, I got told about El Coco, and my husband grew up with the Kukui. Now... When you think about it, they are the same person uh, when you look into it and everything. It is the same actual... Uh, Basically the same creature, right. They're just the different names because of the different languages. 
I mean, yes, we all speak Spanish, but it's a different form, a different pronunciation. Right. Well, it's like taking like a high German and common German or like Mandarin Chinese and then mainland Chinese. Um, yes. Yeah. Regional. It's almost like a regional dialect. Yeah. Like, um, have you ever heard of a Lisbon country? Uh, what was it again? Lisbon. Um, no, I don't think it's I have. A, it's, a, it's another language, and it's, a, it's indigenous to South America. It's not really Portuguese, but it's not Spanish. It's called Lucifer. And, well, they are originally who started it. And what it was is it's a, um, it's a commonly figure of speech that made him into a ghost monster. Like our, like, you know, the Americans have our boogeyman. Right. Well, we also, in Hispanic, in Hispanic culture, we have what is called bugbear. Right. Which, what he was, is, yeah, I say it, and my son knows who that is, because that's how I scared him. Um, <laughs> but as we're speaking, and I forgot my little ones in the room. Right. Yeah, he's he's checked out. Well, let me yeah, ask. He's checked out now. Bugbear is um, our way of representing an exaggerated fear that most children can have, and it's very simple. This is something that came from like the 1700s. It is how long we've had bugbear in our Hispanic culture. And what he is, is he is a little gremlin bear that comes and attacks you in your sleep. He watches you while you're awake and watches all the bad things you do. And depending on how bad you are, depends on if you stay at home in bed or if you get taken. Well, you know something that almost it has a weird cross between almost a Krampus meets uh, the night hag type of thing. Like, you know, once you're asleep, because there's a lot of I mean, because like I said, you know, traveling to Asian countries and stuff, there's a lot of that, you know, uh, like the old woman and stuff, you know, where she doesn't like you. You do something that's disrespectful. Uh -huh. She'll get on your chest and she'll basically suffocate you. And uh yeah. And th we have that here, stuff like that in the South, too. And I know some of that ties off on, you know, conditions maybe that people couldn't explain. Uh, now, did the bugbear, because I know there's a lot of rainforest and stuff down that way, did, is any of that stemming from things that people experienced in living in the rainforest? I believe so. Because from what, from what I understand, what the bugbear, the bugbear I grew up learning about came from my Puerto Rican island. It came from Puerto Rico. Okay. And it was a, um, well, what we call mythical creature because we can't find him, right. obviously, you know, much like our modern-day Bigfoot. Mothman, something you know, like that, yeah. Mothman, Dogman, all of those. Those that we know, they're out there but we can't physically find them yet. That's what the bug bear is. He's a bear that has been around for centuries that is said to be one of the scariest things you can ever come across. And he's bigger than any average bear has ever been recorded. So this is like almost like a prehistoric dire bear. It was like a, that actually did it went from the story that I heard from my grandma Ma before she died. What she would tell me is that this was this came from a bear that apparently went through Puerto Rico and demolished villages. He was a he was a man killer. He really was. He was after and he mainly ate children, which you know they're the smaller prey. Right. So they just used that as 
their horror story and they made it into more. Like, for the Kokoi, for example, in the 17th century, we have um, a rhyme. Now, I'll say it in Spanish and I'll translate it into English for you so that you can understand it. What it is is, Bromete niño, dormete ya, que bien a coco y toquemera. Sleep, child, sleep now. Here comes the coco and he will eat you. That sucks. That sucks. I'd never want to hear that. Okay. I don't want to hear it now. Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Now it gets even worse because the, you know, with it coming from Portuguese, the Portuguese went ahead and they have a lullaby of their own from it. Now, it's a lullaby that was changed. Uh, you may have actually heard it before in movies because I've, I've heard this name be brought up in several of our urban legend movies. Papai Negro. That's, that's his name. It's Papai Negro. He's called a black eater. The, it's another name that the Portuguese use to signify coco. But the problem is, is in Portuguese, it's a female. Oh. It's not a man. It's it, said to be a female version. And it goes, Vai te coca, vai te coca, para cima. Do telhado, de exa o menino, dormir, um soninho, de secundo. Leave coca, leave coca, go to the top of the roof, let the children have a quiet sleep. Now you were supposed to say this much like we say our, you know, like, no, I that, walk through the shadow of the yeah. valley of death. Right. Now lay me down to sleep, that type of thing. And lay me down to sleep. Yes. Right. So when we say those, this is what Hispanic children would say. They would they would repeat this lullaby before bed every night so that they could have a good night's sleep. See, that almost ties in with, like, the, the whole Lilla thing with it being a female. Because it, it kind of goes against... The maternal instinct you would think of eating children, you know, but then there's also that thing of a mother would do anything to save her child, maybe up to the point of, of putting another child. And on. that's where the Brazilians bring theirs in because the Brazilians believe Kokoi is a shapeshifter. So, the kind Bra of like the Brazilians truly, in their heart and in their biggest fears, they believe it is a true shapeshifter. It is something that he walks around daily with you. He could be your best friend. And at night, he changes into the your most, the biggest fear you have. Now, does the this. one thing that you're afraid of. Now, does that tie in with like the, like the Navajo skinwalkers and all that? Or does that. Are those just two different pieces I, of method? I actually, I believe it does, because the Brazilian form of the shapeshifter, Bicho Papayo, which is a monster that shapeshifts by what the child fears most. That, yeah. that seems to me more like a skinwalker than just the average boogie man. Gotcha. And it seems more like a skinwalker than a ghost. Because, like, the Brazilians, they have two of them. They have Dormen and Main, que a coca vem pegar papi foi na roca, mame foi asar, which is sleep baby or the coca will catch you. Daddy is in the plantation and mommy went out. No good. And then they went on with Bicho Papai in Cima de Talhora, de Exa Mi Menudo de Mor, Tuno 
the gospel, which is boogeyman atop the roof, let my child have a quiet sleep. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this, as, as we're getting ready to wind this down, of all these friggin' nightmare stories that you had as a kid, man, I thought I had it bad. Um, what was the one that really stuck with you or that scared you the most or maybe made you interested in sort of the paranormal stuff, you know, because I know you also have an interest in a lot of the shows. The Kukui and is it. With, with the Kukui, with my grandparents, I have one that's Spaniard and one that's Puerto Rican. And my Spaniard grandmother told me the Brazilian, the much scarier version, and she was the one that was around me a lot more. And that intrigued me into finding out if they were real, right. if it was something that I could get rid of, or if it was a manifestation. Right. Well, um, that, that's real similar. Like I said, you know, it, it almost mirrors the same stuff with me because, like you said, it it hits you so viscerally that you go, I have to know just so I can get yes. some sleep. Oh, yes. And then, you know, my Puerto Rican grandmother, her telling me about the core and it being a female, like, <laughs> I can honestly say that kind of made it very hard for my mom. Um, I was very distrusting of women for a long time. I didn't trust that they weren't going to shape shift into some scary monster that was going to eat me in my sleep. Jesus, yeah, talk about trust issues. Uh, you know, um, I, I didn't have a female um, caretaker up until I was like fourteen, and then I was like, oh, okay, we're good. We can deal with each other, right? I guess. <laughs> well, look, uh, still keeping a knife under my bed at night. <laughs> you know, like I said, a, a lot of times. I mean, if you see the video, let me cock my head over here. I actually have a small. Um, tongue depressor um, crucifix that I made uh, that I'd gotten from, from a, a doctor friend of mine because uh, I always I told him I was, was always into Salem's Lot and stuff like that. And when I was a kid, especially after seeing some of that, uh, I would keep like a small Bible next to my bed and I would keep like a little tongue depressor crucifix or I would keep, you know, whatever. Maybe I would, uh, from like a Christmas ornament, I would keep one that's, you know, look like a cross. I would keep it under my pillow. So, I mean, yeah, I relate to that. And, and I think that's just uh, part of it, is, I guess, just the uncertainty of being a child. And then when you have folks that are that you kind of see as authority figures and they're not even necessarily trying to screw you up, but they're just like, hey, man, you need to stay in bed. But, you know, when you have authority figures going, yeah, this is real. How else are you going to take it? And, um, and you just ha you have to kind of uh, come through that on your own and either in, in time kind of put it away or try to disprove it or, or, or to prove it. But, uh, Brittany, I'll tell you what, I'm getting ready to uh, shut this segment down. But I wanted to appreciate, uh, I wanted to I do appreciate it. I wanted to thank you for coming on and spending some time with it. I, I never realized there was such a, a, a varied variety of nightmare creatures in, in, in your culture. Yeah, real quick, if anybody wants to look on YouTube, they can look up Joe Hayes. He did a YouTube podcast about the El Cucuy, and it gives you a real great definition. He does a really good story, and he actually put out a children's book about it in you, 2001. Well, I was going to ask you, I knew he put out the book, but was it just called the Cucuy or El Cucuy? It's El Cucuy. Right. E-L-C-U-C-U-Y. Great. Well, Brittany, I appreciate it. And like I said, uh, if I can get that uh, link from you later, I'll try to include it in the uh, description of this video, which was episode 10, which uh, I guess I should call it the Bloody Bones Kakoi Latino Nightmare uh, introduction that Steve will never sleep again. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do is uh, after this, I guess I'm going to go buy about 20 or 30 flashlights because I'm not going to sleep in the dark again. Uh, but again, I appreciate well, you being on. you can just go buy a little Day of the Dead skull. Those are what we traditionally use in our homes to keep him away. Cool. I mean, I've, I've got enough little freaky skulls in here. I'm probably okay. Uh, that or he'll come in and say, these are my kind of people and they'll be all right with me. So I it's, think it's highly possible. Maybe. I don't know. I might be a skinwalker. You don't know. 
Mm, now that's questionable. Yeah, let, let, rattle that around in your noggin for a minute. But I guess I should. <laughs> I'm, I guess I should tell these folks bye. Uh, again, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, as always, I want to thank our sponsor, um, Allers Oddities. Everything weird, everything creepy. They've got that. Uh, check them out uh, on Facebook. They're located in Paducah, Kentucky. Also, Posh Embroidery here in Princeton, Kentucky, that does all my crazy, weird hauntings of shirts and stuff. We're getting ready to do a signing for the second book of the haunting series, Hauntings of the Western Lunatic Asylum, out at the end of this month. Plug, plug. And we're going to probably have some of the shirts out there available and maybe even some of the artwork that you see that I've done on the back of the wall that will be available for sale because uh, Stevie's got to get paid. But until then, you know, enjoy the daylight. But as night slows down, Check your closets, look up under your bed. You know, I don't want a bugbear interaction or an encounter tonight. And until then, stay scared. <laughs>